And then uh, I will share the screen. Oh yeah, that's, so I don't know if I did that one, okay. So I, so here's one of the tests. I can't remember if I had a, um, I can't remember if I had a, uh, if this one had a, let's see if this one does that. Let's see if we can do, oh good, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so can you all see this test here? Or I'll yes. Blow it up. I'll blow it up so it's bigger. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. So uh, is it, was this one, did this one have an answer for it? I can't remember if it did or not. Let's see. No, it didn't. I think it was one of the practice ones. Okay, so so that was one that didn't have. So, you, uh, so well, I'll work on this one. Um, it, this one does have a Queenie McCluskey question, but I'm not going to ask you one. Uh, that's why I usually do the quiz, but I'm not going to do the quiz either. I, I'm kind of downplaying this. I, it's more of an exercise, and I, I don't know how useful it is to work on this. I, I mean, it's it's interesting, but I don't think you're ever going to do this in your entire career. So, um, okay. So, so the fundamental skill that I want you to come away with, um, it, it, at least from this part of the course, I want you to be able to take a truth table and uh, translate it into equations and simplify it. And then take those equations and, and basically turn them into a network of logic gates that represent a solution to the problem uh, that, would, that would in fact generate the right output for F for every combination of input variables. In this case, there are four input variables, A, B, C, D, and that gives us 16 possible combinations. And for all 16, we've specified the value for f. Now, first off, because this is a point of confusion, let me ask a question. How, yeah, where do we go ahead? Oh, my bad. Sorry. Where, where do we get where do we get f? What where, where does f come from? The store. That's right. You know, I like to say that it comes from God, but just to kind of dramatize it. But the idea is your customer gives you f. You don't you don't have to figure out f. You're given f. Now typically the customer doesn't really give you the truth table. The customer tells you the problem he wants to solve and you have to reduce it to a truth table. And in that process, you have to translate his English into Boolean basically. And that's where you can make some bad assumptions. So you need to always be on your guard and asking questions to make sure when you translate it from what the customer describes that they want, it turns into the, something that actually resembles what they actually wanted. And, uh, but once you get it in a truth table form, then all, all of the uncertainty, all the, all the confusion is gone, right? And all you're doing is uh, you are just, uh, you're, you're just turning the wheel and grinding out a solution. Now this is, you know, this is what the engineers do, you know, and, and you wanna, you, you, it, you may actually be putting the solution in a, on a whole bunch of different forms. You may be using a microprocessor, you may be doing programmable logic, you may be making an integrated circuit, you may be, you know, wiring up some discrete parts. There's all sorts of things you might be doing to actually, uh, gen you know, that, that's gonna be the hardware target when it's all said and done. But, but the logic behind it's gonna go in this truth table. Now, in truth, most problems are not just combinational. Most problems actually are sequential designs. And that's why from this point on, once we finish the test on Friday, uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna be doing sequential design for the rest of the semester. And, and hopefully focus on what you need to know to really do, you know, to really be able to design a state machine. But at, there'll be lots of parts of that state machine that are, that are networks that are combinational networks you have to design. Uh, the inputs to the flip-flops, the, the, the network that drives the outputs, all those things are going to be part, part and parcel of what you have to, uh, you know, what you have to do. Okay, so, so here's a truth table. And here's, here's what we've sorted out. We think this is going to satisfy our customer. If we can generate these values for F for all these values for these, for these four input variables. So the independent variables are A, B, C, D. The dependent variable is F. There could be more than one dependent variable. In many cases, there are. But in this particular case, we're just given one. Now, in this part of the course, we've really focused on K-maps. And, uh, and 
for good reason, because KMAPs are a really good visual tool for, for sort of understanding how logic gets simplified. And, and, it, and your visual system actually does all the work for you. So that's why we like we work on KMAPs. Truth be told, most problems can't be done with KMAPs because they have too many, you know, too many independent variables. So our maps exceed the six variables that is sort of the maximum map you can do. And, and then you're basically stuck um, uh, you're basically stuck then using computer-based tools. Well, that's fine. Uh, it's probably easier. But but to do logic design and to use a lot of KMAPs is great because it, it teaches you what's going on sort of under the hood. When you're using those tools later on, you'll kind of have a good sense of what they're doing. Uh, and you can sort of imagine it in your mind because you've you've thought through it with KMAPs a lot. All right. So so this is useful and good, but, in, but probably be doing computer-based tools more later on. All right, so what we have to do is we have to figure out how to get the information off the truth table into the KMAP so we can then let our visual system do all the work and come up with our optimal solution, our, our minimum solution. And uh, the first thing we have to do is extract the information and put it in here. And we do that in a four variable KMAP, we have to remember to flip the bottom two rows and flip the rightmost two columns. And as long as we remember that, we're good. So the first thing we do is we number these little boxes. We don't usually do this from this point on, but this is just kind of to help you, you know, these are training wheels to kind of get you going. So this would be zero. We always start with zero in this square. One, then we skip down to the bottom, two, three, then over here, four, five, down to the bottom, six, seven. And then we go to the far right column, eight, nine, 10, 11, and then 12, 13, 14. And this then is 15. So, uh, so it's good to remember, this is 15, this is seven. And if you check that, you probably got it right. Now, I, I encourage you to put A, B in the top and C, D down the side and, and order them hierarchically, A, B, C, D. So that the low order is D and the higher order is A. A starts as zero, you get eight zeros and eight ones. B, you get four, 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 four. And then C, you get two, 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 two. And D, you get every other one is flipped. Okay. So this is the low order variable. And, and throughout your digital career, you'll be thinking about higher, order, low order, and all, the, and all the bits in between. Okay. So now that we, so let's, so if we do this, um, let's see, I, yeah, well, so, so basically, I'm, I'm not going to number the little boxes, but, but obviously we can put a zero there, a one there. Then we skip down here, we put the zero, and then we put the one there. Then we go up here, so that's one, two, three, four. And then we do zero, one, zero, one. So zero, one, zero, one. And then we go all the way over here. So, that's, so now that starts here, zero, one, one, zero. So zero, one, one zero and here the last four one zero zero one one zero zero one so 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 this is the way you map it in here now now what we can do and what i usually do is i, I usually i i usually oops i didn't want to do that um so i i usually i usually get rid of uh the zeros because it, it tends to confuse me visually. Look, Damien. Look. So look. Let's look see. for other ones. There's a white one. Look, if there's not a red one there, look in the fucking pantry. Hey, so, Craig, so, so Craig, you, bud. you might want to mute yourself. Yeah. It's always a bad look to be cussing at your wife. Okay. Um, so now we don't have the zeros. <laughs> we know everywhere there, there's a blank cell, that's good. That's going to be a zero. So, but but it's a lot cleaner, right? Now we can actually see patterns that maybe we wouldn't have seen if we hadn't done that. So I, I always take out the zeros. Now, if you're doing the zeros, I create a second map and I put the zeros in. Now, if you have don't cares, you always have to have the don't cares, whether you're looking at ones or zeros, you also always have the don't cares. Some of them will wind up being zero, some of them won't, that's fine. All right, so I draw a little circle around these ones. That's, I can group these, this group of four. And then 
what can I do anything with this one here? Yeah, I can group it with this one over here because you have wraparound effects. This one, I can group with this one. So we'll group that. So even though the, this one was in this group of four and this one's in this group of four, I can use it again in this group of two. And I can use this one again in this group of two here. And then I have a one down here. Can I hook that up with anything? No, that's, that's gonna be a loop by itself. And this is gonna be a loop by itself. So, so I, you know, I could, you know, I, so when it's all said and done, I could do. Um, so we do this little group of four here. And so we'll, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, maybe I shouldn't do this. No. Probably should print it out and do it on the camera. But anyway, let me. Um, maybe you could highlight. No, I need to. I just needed to do that, and uh, we'll make it. We'll make it red. Make it thicker. Okay, and then I'm gonna. Uh, so. So we're gonna put one on this little one there. And then we're going to put one on this little one here. And then we'll shrink this down like this. And we'll loop these two. And then this one, you have to kind of do a little funky thing. We won't worry about that right now. Uh, where, we, where we loop this one with that one. OK, so anyway, uh, I guess we can do that with that little arc. And then, mm -hmm. so we basically put these over here. Okay, so the, so now we have one group. We have one, two groups of one, one on with this one, two, two groups of two, and one group of four. So we we're going to have one, two, three four, five terms, one term. So these terms will have all four of the independent variables in them. The group of two will drop a variable, so they'll have three. So we'll have two, four variable terms, two, three variable terms, and one, two variable term. Now, what are they? Well, we just look. So we know that this one's gonna be A, B, C prime, D prime. This one's gonna be A, B prime, C, D prime. This one's gonna be, so what, what drops? So we group two, what, what variable drops out of this one? Well, A does because A is a one here and A is a zero there, so A drops. So we have B prime, C prime, D. And what about this group of, this group of, uh, this group of two here? So that's gonna be B, C, D. And then this group of four is gonna be A prime, D. So then we write that down. So, so the this group of two there is going to be is going to be uh, a b. Uh, let's see, a b uh, d prime or sorry c prime d prime plus this group this group this group this single box by itself a b prime c d prime. A, B prime, C, D prime, plus, then, then we're gonna do the groups of two. So this one would be, this one would be B prime, C prime, D. And this group of four, this group of two rather, is gonna be B, C, D, oops. And then finally, will this group of four is going to be A prime D.
So that's so that's that's the SOP minimum. That well, that's that's the SOP minimum form. You can't you can't reduce that at all. That's as much as it can be reduced. Uh, a B C prime B. Okay. Now, if we wanted to do if we wanted to do the the zeros, then we then we'd have the zeros here. We could combine with these two for a group of four, and then we'd have this one combined with this one for a group of two, this one by itself, and this one combined with that one. So it looks like that our uh, that our uh, POS form would be a simpler uh, would would have fewer fewer gates and uh, or fewer terms, fewer fewer literals anyway. All right, so let's let's go down and look at this flip flop. So we've covered flip flops. So you should be able to look at this. Obviously, it's a JK flip flop. It says so right on it, actually. And how would you turn this JK into a D flip flop? I think I'll print this up. You will pull the D with an embedder. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd invert, you put a D, you put D directly into J, and you'd invert it into K. I'm going to... uh, sorry, the better will go into the K, right? Yes, K. that's correct. Thank you. And that way, whatever D is, that's always going to create the next. Uh, that's going to create the next output. All right. Let's see. Let me turn my oscilloscope meter. Move this over. Okay. All right. Now, so yeah, so you'd have your D input. And you'd go directly into J, but you'd have an inverter into the K. OK, um, so draw the connections. And then it's, it, if we wanted to have a negative edge clock, you have to put a bubble on this output. All right. So given, this, given the following switching function, show with G how to. Uh, show for G, show with gates how to realize it in two layers, and then how you would Professor, modify the expression. Yeah. Does it matter for, for question four what goes in the top of the JK flip flop when you're converting it into a D? Like, usually there's like a set or a clear, does, does it matter? No. Yeah. I mean, if it had a set or a clear, you'd probably just leave it alone. Yeah. You just ignore it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's realize this in two layers. So, in this case, we're going to have this is in SOP form, so we know that's and or. So we're going to have and gates up here, and we're going to have one or gate down here, and they're just going to be connected like this. And these are the, going to be the variables going into these gates. Now you you know in this case I didn't want you necessarily to try and simplify it, so don't worry about that. I don't know if you can. I didn't even really look. Uh, so we talked about hazard, and uh, what, is, what is a static zero hazard? That's one where, where if this is one and this is zero, it can, it's supposed to stay at zero, but what it does, it goes up to one for a little bit and then goes back down to zero. And, it, and this, is, this is a glitch. All right. So here's a little VHDL code. So F is assigned A ended with B after five. D is assigned not C after three, and G is F or D after one after ten nanoseconds. So basically, we have A and B anded together. So there's an AND gate, A and B, and it's five nanoseconds. You can write that in there or not; it doesn't really matter. And then, then uh, D is uh, is uh, goes through goes through a little inverter with three nanoseconds delay. 
And then these two go into an OR gate and that gives you G. And this has 10 nanosecond delay. And then I ask this little question, you know, draw the device, assume that there are, these are zero and B is one at the start. If A and C both change to A equals one, C equals one at time T seven, when does G go to one? I, I, I won't ask you a question like this. It's because uh, it, this one was a little tricky, but in any event, you, what you would do then is you would go ahead and label everything. So we know that, we know A is zero, B is one. So the output of this AND gate is a zero. We know that uh, D is a zero. So the output of this is a one. The one going in here means G equals one. Um, but they said G equals zero. So what that means is the 10 nanoseconds hasn't run yet. So that was a little bit of a tricky question. So not to worry about that. Um, I don't think I'm just, I think we'll skip the rest of that. Okay, use a K-map to find all the terms and write the midterm expression for it. So basically, we just plot these terms. We plot C, BD, and A, B prime, C prime. So C, C is all these boxes here. BD, so the center two columns are B and the middle two rows are D. So D are these four squares right here. C, BD are these four squares. So that would be BD. This would be C. And then A, B prime, C. So A are these two columns. B prime are the top and bottom rows and C prime is the top row. So it's these two. So this is AB prime C, this is BD, and this is C. And that gives us min term, so that's zero, one. So it's, so it's min term two, three, two, three. So five, six, seven, and then eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So, and we just write those in up here and that would be, that would be the answer. Okay. And then here we have a, here we have a little timing diagram. Use the JK flip-flop picture right in the tracing for Q in the timing diagram. Assume that the time for the output to change after the active edge of the clock is 10 nanoseconds. So each one of these are 10. That's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So, so every one of these little spaces is 10 nanoseconds. So we know that even though the, the, the signals will change, the output won't change for 10 nanoseconds because that's how long it takes the circuitry to respond, okay? So, uh, so first off, what kind of clock do we have there? Rising, yeah, it's a rising edge clock. That's right. Yeah, it's a rising edge clock exactly. And uh, so, so what we should do, we should go mark all the rising edges because we know that this is potentially where the clock's gonna gonna be uh, taking effect. Actually, we probably should do the others first. Okay, and then then we have J. So at this rising edge, J is a one, K is a zero. At this rising edge, J is a zero, K is a one. This rising edge, one, one. This rising edge, one, one. This rising edge, one, zero. And here, zero, zero. Okay, so now all we have to do is figure out whether whether J is a one uh, and K, what, what J and K are at the edge. And then 10 nanoseconds later, we'll see the change. Okay, so here J is one, K is zero. And, and the only thing you have to remember, it's very simple. You have to remember J sets, K clears. Okay, if they're both zero, nothing happens. If they're both one, then whatever the output is flips, it toggles. So, so here, J sets, K clears. So we know that we know that 10 nanoseconds after this active edge, which is right here, which is here, so it starts off zero, it's gonna stay zero, and it's gonna go up here 10 nanoseconds later. Now we know nothing can change until we get 10 nanoseconds after this edge. Here, J is zero, K is one, K clears, so we're gonna go back down to zero. We're gonna stay down here until at least 10 nanoseconds after the next active edge, which is right there. So that'll be here. They're both one, so it's gonna to toggle. So we're gonna flip up the one. Here, they're both one again, so we're gonna to toggle down to zero. Here we have one zero, so we're gonna go set here. 
And here they're both zero, so we're going to hold. So that's all there is to that. Okay, let me, um, I'll probably, I'll, I think I'll. Professor? Uh huh. Can we look at number eight again? Sure. Yeah, let me, let me share the screen again. And we'll do that. So, yeah, number eight. Um, I thought, like, you see those two ones at the top right? I thought it would be um, different. Yeah, that one circle, I thought the one that's on the left would be below the one at the very top right corner. So it would be like a, a vertical loop. No, because, there, because, uh, because, so, so in this box, what, what are the, what are, so, so, so let's write it out. So this box would be, that box would be uh, A, B, C prime, D prime. And this box would be A, B prime, C prime, D prime. When you can bring, bring those together, you get A, C prime, D prime, because the B drops. So, you, so that checks, this is, a, B prime, C prime, that it has to be these two boxes. If you use these two, what would it be? Well, then it would be A, B prime, C prime. Um, can we do it with the numbers on top? Like how I thought it was, it would be one, one, and then one, zero. Yeah, like, well, that's just... yeah, if we go back to this, so what you're saying, if you do this, so this is A, B prime, this is C prime, D prime, this is C prime, D. So if it were this, what variable would drop? The D would drop. Because it would be D prime here, it would be D prime here, and it would be D here. So you would have no D, and this group of two then would be A, B prime, C prime. Well, that's kind of what I thought, because wasn't it in the problem it was representing A? Oh, in the prime, problem, in the problem, it's A. Oh, oh, maybe it is. Maybe I misread it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, it is A, B prime, C prime. Okay, yeah, so you're right. That, that is correct. I, I don't know how I did that, but yeah, that's that's right. Yes, yeah, so this, this would be, I guess I just misread the thing because I couldn't see it. Yeah, so, so if it were these two boxes, then it would be a, uh, A, C prime, D prime, which is for some reason what I thought I had. And in these two boxes then would be A, B prime, C prime. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So the actual, I, I messed that up. So yeah, I made a mistake. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Yes. Professor, right. can, I see, can I see just number 10, just a little bit, just, uh, just to take a uh, Little, a sure. little peek to it. I just, I just yeah. I was, I was doing it with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. I just want to make sure if I have it right. Just a minute. See, I'm going to flip this up real quick. Oh, sorry. I'll move this over here. And let's see. Um, okay. Almost finished. Almost finished. <laughs> okay, no problem. Just one question, like in the last part of the line of, of Q, uh, when it's zero, zero, shouldn't the graph going down to zero after no. 10 minutes? No, when, when J and K are both zero, what is what is, what does the flip-flop do? Does it change or does it hold? Oh, it holds, it holds. Okay, okay, so it goes straight, okay, okay. Thank you, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let me just bring this up. I, I think I'll probably just. Uh... 
Oh, I see. It's probably that one. Uh, let's see. It must be, yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. All right. Um, okay. I'm just going to go through. I, I'll just kind of ask some questions in uh, that may be similar to the questions that are going to be on the test. Let me stop sharing here. Yeah, I'll leave that like that. Okay. So, um, Let's see. So I think, uh, let's, yeah, let me pull up that. Um, I think this was, um, let's see, test one, test two. Let's see what this is. Excuse me, Professor, I have a yeah. question. Yeah, go ahead. So is the exam going to be timed like last time? Uh, so uh, yeah, it, 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 it will have time. Uh, so, so let me, I'll just, I'll kind of explain my thinking about that. So, so these are obviously open book tests, right? You're sitting there, you can go on the internet, you can Google, you can look at your textbook and that's fine. I don't have any problem with that at all. But so if you know what you're doing uh, and you're just confused over a little point and you need to check something, no big deal. But if you hit a problem and you have no clue and then you're Googling around and you're trying to actually teach yourself the material that you should have already learned, then it's going to take you quite a bit of time to do that. And so, so if we'd made this an unlimited time, it's more like a homework than a test. Uh, so I, I want you to have a little bit of time pressure, but I don't want you to have so much time pressure that you're having to race through it. The, the people that get into trouble are people out there Googling all over the internet trying to find the answers. And that's where, and the other thing, of course, if there's unlimited time, uh, then, you, then the, the potential to, to you know, get help from other students is also pretty significant. So, so a little bit of time pressure is necessary just to kind of keep everybody honest. But, uh, you know, so I, I, I'll, I'll set it up so you have plenty of time. I, I think the last test, there were a couple of people that, you know, that's, that got bogged down, you know, trying to work out answers to, to, you know, a handful of problems and then didn't get through and answer all the problems. Uh, I think you had 90 minutes last time. I'll probably give you uh, 120 minutes this time. So we have two hours to do. I, let's see, how many questions are there? I forgot. Uh, um, Let's see, where's my thing? Yeah, they're like, there'll be 30, 35, 40 questions, something like that. So you'll have, you know, with 40 questions, you'd have three minutes a question. And, 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 and you don't have to write anything. You know, all you have to do is basically, um, you know, pick an answer. And quite That's a few of them are true or false. Thank so, you so much for clarifying. Yeah, so that's the idea. But I'll, I'll probably give you I'll probably give you two hours on this one. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right. Did you have Did, did you feel time crunched the last one? So yeah. I yeah. Some, yeah, just a little bit. Yes. I was, I was kind yeah, of surprised that I got so. Like for example, I finish it just like five minutes left before. Like I just got five minutes left to finish it. Like, yeah. but I mean, I could answer all the equations. But it's just uh, like for example, like for when I was summing or trying to add binary numbers, I like to like to ensure that I have the answers right. So I didn't have time to make sure that I uh, that I answer the questions right. I had to go through it like really fast. But I mean, I passed it, but it was really hard for me. Yeah. Well, you'll have a little more time on this one, and hopefully. The, the, the last one's a little more tricky, maybe. I think this one's a little more straightforward. I think the material's easier. Um, it's, Thank you. It's more advanced, but I, I think it's a little easier. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, let me get rid of this. And let me shrink this. And this. Okay, so yeah, I'll do this. Right. Okay, so uh, so I'm just going to go through some questions, and uh, I may share that. Let's see. I'll let me pop this up, and I'll, I think this is the I think this is the diagram that goes with the test. 
Let's see, email. Um, professor? Yeah. Can you clarify one more time? Was it multiple choice? Uh, so it'll be similar to the last test. So there, there'll be, they all won't all be multiple choice. Some will be true, false. In some cases, there'll be one answer that you have to pick. In some cases, there'll be several answers that could be right. In, in some cases, there'll be a numeric answer that you have to put in. So it, it'll be a mixture of those kind of questions. All right. But I, th I think it's just numeric, uh, multiple choice, true, false, multiple answer. Um, uh, actually, I guess I have a matching question. But I mean, they're, they're mo yeah, pretty much that's all. And oh, I guess I even have a fill in the blank question. <laughs> I, the fill in, the, I think one, anyway, but 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 it, that's what it'll be. Mostly true, false, multiple choice, multiple answer, numeric. And then a few, I guess there were one or two weird questions. Is Quinn McCluskey gonna be something? That no, we'll I'm not gonna ask you about Quinn and McCluskey. All right. So you, you can, I mean, I, you know, I'd like you to have looked at it, thought about it, but, but uh, you, you're not going to be tested on it. Okay, so uh, let me share the screen again. Let's see, where did that thing go? Um, uh, oh, there. Okay, so uh, let me share the screen. And uh, so, so I think this is this sheet that goes with it. Uh, this so uh, so it may it may look similar. This may look a little different. So uh, just use this use this as as reference basically. Um, so uh, so in this case, uh, and I can't remember, but but what I'll probably do. So so you, you what you'll probably what you should do is just go ahead and and plot the ones and then use this little map down here and plot the zeros down there. And so you can look at either the SOP or the POS solution. I might ask you either one. So I might ask you, for instance, how many prime implicants there are. And and uh, and so uh, so when you look at when you look at that. So if I if I bring this back up, let's look at that. So this is the one we just looked at. So how many prime implicants do we have here? Not counting this Five one. or no, there's just so there's just ones that are yeah, there's so there's one, two, then this one, three, and then four, five. So there are five. Exactly. You know, those are a little, these are a little dimmer. They did a little thicker, but all right. So so yeah, so we have this group of four, this group of two this group of two, this group of one, this group of one. Four prime implicants. The fact that these are groups of one, they're still prime implicants because they cannot be combined with another group of one to make a group of two. And uh, this group of four, the, these two aren't independent. And there, and there are always some tricky things that you have to kind of keep, keep alert for. For instance, if you have a map like this, One of the one of the easiest ones to mess up is is say something like this. So so how many prime implicants do you guys see here? Is it four? Would it be four? So so okay so four. So let's look. So we have a group of we have a group of four here, and then. We also have another group of four here, and we have one by itself here, and we have a group of four here. So yeah, one, two, three, four. There are four prime implicants. But a lot of students will come and, and not see this as a group of four. They'll make th these two a group of two. So it's easy to make that mistake. You'd get the prime implicant question right, but you'd miss some others. All right, how many, how many, back to our other one, how many non-essential prime applicants do we have on this map? Three. No, they're all essential. 
your solution has to include every single prime implicate. So there are no non-essentials. Okay. So if we did it, if, you know, how about if we do this map? Do you, are there any non-essentials on this? And the answer is the same. No, they're not. They're all essential there too. All right. Um, Just curious. Sorry, is, does that mean all the prime implicants are always essential? No, not at all. There definitely are not. There, there are prime implicants that are not essential. Let's do another one. Say we have, let's say we have something like this. All right, it's about a square, but anyway. So let's say we have one here, one there, one there, one here, one there, one there, say one there, one there. So there are several different ways you can do this. Um, maybe when we have one there. Okay, so you can do the group of four here, and then you, you can do a group of two here. You can do a group of two there. Well, actually, that's one row, so that's a bad example. But... Uh, so here you have a group of two, and there you have a group of two. And then you have this one, that's a group of two. So yeah, so if we redraw this, just to make it cleaner. Okay, so we have, we have this whole row. So we've got that whole row, we've got this group of four, we've got these two, a group of two, but there's also a group of two there, and there's a group of two here. Okay, so how, first off, how many prime applicants? So you have one, two, three, four, five. How many essential? Well, this row is essential. This group of four is essential. This group of two is essential, but you, you've got, uh, then this one's essential because nothing else covers this one except this group of two. But this one and this one are both covered by other prime implicants. Even though this is a prime implicant, it is not essential. So you have one, two, three, four essentials and one non-essential. And your solution does not need this non-essential. So you, your solution would be four terms. Two, two variable terms, two, three variable terms. I see. So if they're completely overlapped by other prime implicants, then they're not essential. That's right. If, okay. if, if there's any boxes that are, that, are, that are by themselves, it makes that prime implicant essential. But if, they're, but if all the boxes in a given term, like let's say, let's say for sake of argument, you had a one up here too, then, then actually this group of four would be non-essential. And you'd actually have a group of four here too. But I mean... This group of four would be essential. This group of four would not be. And your solution, your solution would be this group of this row, this group of two, this group of four, and then th that group there. So the non-essential in that case would be this group of four right in the middle. So would the non-essential terms be consensus terms? Yes. They, they, I, I think for all intents and purposes, they should always be consensus terms. And yeah, so. That's right. I have a question. Okay. What's the uh, what's the biggest grouping you can do for prime implicants? Because I think I've seen it where you've grouped like eight of them. Yeah. So it's all it's only powers of two. Let me say that again. Only powers of two. So you can group one box, two boxes, four boxes, eight boxes, sixteen boxes. So on a four variable map, which has a total of sixteen boxes. <clears throat> if you have a one in every square, your answer is the constant one. If you have a zero in every square, your answer is the constant zero, and you have all 16 boxes grouped. You've dropped all the independent variables drop out, and you only are left with a constant. So you can't do like six, correct? No. Okay. Yeah, can't do six, can't do 10, can't do 12, can't do 14. Powers of two only. Okay, uh, let's see. So uh, we talked about that. Uh, a single box all by itself can definitely be a prime implicant. Um, so make sure you practice extracting, you know, from a K map the, the prime implicants. 
uh, I mean, it's easy to make a little mistake like I did. Just always double check your work and, you know, try and make sure not to make a stupid little mistake because it's easy to do. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Yeah, so, um, yeah, okay, I think we, I think I actually use a different, let me see where that was. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna, well, let me keep going, I'll, I'll come back. Um, I think we're gonna, I, th I guess we're gonna do a problem, we're gonna do a problem. So you'll definitely get one problem where we either implement it with a multiplexer, where we, where we implement it with a, uh, with a, uh, um, a, a three to eight decoder or where we implement it with a read-only memory. So you should look at all three of those problems. And I think, I th I think there are examples um, in there. And uh, I, I think I have some, uh, some review stuff for the test that I'll, I'll, that I'll, there's a video, I'll post this video. And I, I think there's a video from last year that's there. I'll, I'll make sure I post that too. Um, I think it's already there actually. Um, so let's see. Um, problem three. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, let me get rid of this. I don't think this is correct. Oh yeah. Okay. Here we go. So, so here we have a multiplexer, right? So how do you approach this problem? Well, the first step, you, you take the truth table and you divide it into, into pair, into pairs of rows, the first two rows, the next two rows, the next two rows and so forth. And if you do that, it will really help you because then all you have to do is look at look at the, the two rows and the desired output F. Now, in this case, uh, we're supposed to generate F. So F equals the sum of the min terms, one, two, five, seven, nine, 10, 14, 15. So the first thing you do is you go in here and, and you put in zero. And in fact, usually I, sometimes I'll just leave the zeros blank and I'll just put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's the ones. I count them up. How many ones do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so that checks. And now I, I go through and I divide these rows. Now I'll, I'll do a couple of them just to sort of show. But if we did a... Okay, and then we'll make, uh, we'll make this... Um... All right, so if you put these in here, so, so we'll divide the first two rows up and the next two, let's see here, my lines are too big. Maybe I'll make them smaller. And uh, there and so forth. And you'd keep going on down to do them all. Okay, and maybe I'll just do these. Yeah, let's see, and then. Okay, so now, so you look at the pairs here. So first off, A, B, and C are, are automatically taken care of. They're connected down here to your control lines. Now you have to make sure if the control lines are labeled something weird, like like uh, like like you know um, CR zero, CR one, CR two. You have to get them hierarchically correct. And so A is high order, B is next, and C is low order. So if they were labeled zero, one, two, you'd have to make A go to two, and C go to zero, and B go to one. But in this case, it's you know ABC, so that's easy. And then what do we put into I0, I1, I2, I3 through I7 to generate the proper F? Well, so you just look. If F follows D, 0, 1, then you can just put D in. So we would just put D in here. If, it, if it's, uh, again, 0, 1, so that would be another D. 0, 1, another D. 0, 1, uh, I, guess, I guess we did D, D, D. Oh, no, this is 1, 0. So, so this is D, but here we have one zero, whereas 
the actual variable d goes zero one. So now we have to put in d prime because it's it's going it's flipped. But here it's the same as d, so it's zero one. So it's d. Here it's d. Here it's d. Here it's d prime again, and then here it's zero zero for those two rows. So we put in the value zero, and here so zero for i six and for i seven it's one for both rows. So we put in the the, the constant one. So that's actually pretty easy to do. All right, any questions about that? Um, yes, for the bottom part where it's A, B, C. Yeah. If it, let's say it was one, two, three, well, it would just be A would go to one, but what if one was where C was and then two was where B was? And you then have to, you, have to you just, you have to make sure that these lines are always gonna be in some sort of hierarchical indication. Uh, usually, usually they're, um, uh, I don't know, let's see if we, if we looked at a data sheet for an eight to one multiplexer, let's, let me do that real quick. We're sort of, Yeah, so let me let me let me share the other screen here. So you can see here's a here's a diagram. So it's S0, S1, S2. What's that? So you see how that is? Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. Yes. So so notice here they're labeled S2, S1, S0. So which one do you think is the higher, which one should A be connected to? S2. That's right. And which one should B be connected to? S1. That's right. And, and what does that leave? It leaves C, the low order control line for S0. So it's always indicated, it's always, whatever diagram you look at, you're always going to see a hierarchical indication. Um, let's see if we can find another one. Yeah, so I guess I like S0. Uh, that's not the universal. Uh, yeah, here's one. Uh, let's see. Those really are not, that's not the right chip even. So yeah, anyway, you, you get the idea. These, so these muxes, um, yeah, they, they always they always show you the high, they're always listed in a hierarchical order. So it's always gonna be set up that way. Otherwise you wouldn't know how to hook it up. So, okay, so here's, here's one with ABC. So they they just vary. They don't list. They're not always done the same. You just have to go out and read the data sheet and figure it out. But uh, but generally, well here now here here's one where you have a S one and S two. That's a four to one. Same idea. So S one is the higher order. S zero is the lower order. And you can implement any three variable problem with a four to one. You can implement any four variable problem with an eight to one. So yeah, all right, I'll go back to this. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's see, we'll go through a few more of these. So what kind of clock, uh, what kind of clock does this flip-flop use? So it's a falling edge because it's got a bubble on it. Does this flip-flop have a set? Yes, it does. Is and the set, remember these, these sets and clears are called asynchronous inputs generally. There is such a thing as a synchronous set and a synchronous clear, but when they're drawn like this, they're assumed to be asynchronous unless the data sheet says they're, they're synchronous. Is, is the asynchronous input active high or low? Which is it? High? Yeah, it's active high because there's no bubble. So when the set, when this input is low, it's exerting no influence on this, on this part. Normally, typically, 
the sets are active high. I mean, are, typically they're active low, but they can be either one. And you might only have a set, you might only have a clear. Sometimes you'll have a set and a clear. All right, um, yeah. And what kind of flip-flop is it? Well, it's obviously a JK. All right, so remember when you, uh, when we, uh, when we take a, a NOR gate, well, we take an OR gate, we can just divide that into two OR gates going into a third OR gate, and it's exactly equivalent. You can't do that with the NOR gate because you have to, you've got this inverter problem. So you have to have two NOR gates, and then they go into an inverter each, and then the outputs of the inverters go into the final NOR gate. So it basically, if you want, and you can use a NOR gate as an inverter, you just tie the, all the inputs together and it becomes an inverter. But, um, or you can just use an inverter, either one. Um, all right, here's where we have, uh, you know, here's where we have the potential for, uh, for uh, uh, a hazard. And the obvious place where you might have a hazard is where you transition from this group of four to this group of four. And the term you would have to include is this group of four up here. So you have this group of four here, which is going to be A prime, C prime. And you have this group of four, which is going to be A, B. And the, the hazard is when you go from this group of four to this column, you, you in theory, you, you could potentially have a hazard there. And you can fix it by adding in the consensus term, which is this group of four here. You don't need the consensus term to solve the problem, but you might need to add it to avoid a hazard. And it all depends on how the hardware is. Um, all right, let's see. So uh, find all the max terms, write shorthand notation. So, uh, so, so what form is this expression in right here? Are those min terms or max terms? Min terms. Those are min terms. So what you can do, you can plot the min terms on the map as ones, and then you can read off the zeros for the max terms. All right. Uh, same thing here. Only here we have a set, so we have to we have to approach this just a little differently. And let me. Uh, so let me just. I'll print this out, and I'll, I'll probably finish with this one. So let me let me print just this page. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the camera. All right, so the so again, in this case, do we have a rising edge or a falling edge clock? Rising. It's a rising edge clock. But I'm not gonna mark these first. First, I'm gonna mark the set, okay? So I look at the set. Is it set active high or active low? High. Okay, it's active high. So I'm gonna mark everywhere the set is active. And the set is active here. And it's active here. So when, at this point, so, so this rising edge is unaffected by the set, but this rising edge is blocked. This one's unaffected. This one's unaffected. This one is unaffected. But this rising edge is blocked. This rising edge is blocked. So I'm only going to mark the ones. So I'm not going to worry about these rising edges. They're not going to have any effect. The ones with the X's on them. And then I'm just going to look at the D. What is the D on this edge? It's zero. I, I can ignore that. What is the D here? It's one. What is the D here? It's zero. What is the D here? It's one. And I ignore those. So I know that after the active edge or after the assertion of the set, 
there's going to be a 10 nanosecond delay. So my 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 output's not going to change right at the set. It's going to change after that. And so uh, so so I'm I'm not going to go through that whole thing. Uh, but 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 that's uh that's how you have to think about that. And um, you know, hopefully, I, I mean, that's uh, if you if you if you approach the problem the way I just showed you, or the way I showed you the other one when you don't have a set, or if you have a clear, same thing, you know that the the clock has no effect when your asynchronous input is asserted, and when it's when it's active, when it's asserted, and if it's not asserted, then the clock does have an effect. So only mark the edges of the clock that, that are active when the asynchronous input is inactive. And then all the other, where this asynchronous input is asserted or active, then ignore the clock because it's not gonna have any effect. Remember though, after the assertion of the asynchronous input, there's still a, a delay. It, it doesn't change it instantaneously. There's a little bit of a delay, just like there is with the clock. Uh, it might not be symmetric, it might not be the same 10, 10 nanoseconds like it is in that was in that problem, but it, uh, it could easily be a different amount of time. But, but uh, and usually the way it works is on data sheets, you get, you get a, a guaranteed maximum time and you get a nominal time. Uh, and they don't usually even, they don't give you a, a minimum time. They give you the, no, the average time and then they give you a guaranteed maximum time, which is a little bit of a pain. But the nice thing is on when you're using these in a, say a, a, a large integrated circuit, most of, the, most of the devices fabricated on the same chip at the same time are gonna have very similar characteristics. So you can usually you know, count on them being similar. Okay, um, I think I'll, I'll stop with that and I'll just, uh, if you have any questions. Um, um, professor? Yeah. Sorry, is it ahead. gonna be, or, no, go you ahead. know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just go, sorry. Is the test gonna be where we can go back and forth or is it gonna be like last time where we couldn't go back and forth? It will be like last time. And that's, All right. it's almost essential. I mean, it's an open book test. All right, thank you. You, you just, yeah, if I give you all the questions, it's like, I, there would be so many students tempted to cheat that it's just not gonna be fair. Um, I mean, you know, it may, when it's random, it makes it a lot harder. Uh, timed and random makes it harder to, to call up somebody and compare your answers because you won't be looking at the same question at the same time. So that's mm -hmm. the whole point. You get it, the, the questions are randomized and the, uh, and, and, and you just get one at a time and you can't back up. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Sorry about that. Um, for the D flip flop, when set is one, does D have any effect on the output? So, so, so back to back. So if we go back to um, let's see, where was that? Uh, yeah, here. So you're asking about this one? Yes. Okay, and the question is, when the set is one. Okay, so first off, is that active or is that is that asserted and active or is that inactive or deasserted? Um, it's asserted. That's right. So when the set is asserted, it's affecting the flip-flop. Right. And it blocks the clock from having any effect. So D doesn't even matter when set is one? No. Okay. Because D is only relevant for the clock edge. Okay. Now, when the set goes away right here, does the flip-flop change at this point? No. That's right. It waits until it gets this next clock edge. In this case, it comes immediately after, but it could easily be along, like in this case, it, it's gonna be a while before the next clock edge is gonna hit. And we don't show it, so we don't know what's gonna go on there. But I mean, it's out here someplace. So you've got all this time where you know the flip-flop's gonna stay set. Nothing can happen till the next clock active edge. Even though the, even though the set is deasserted, doesn't mean the flip-flop goes into the clear state. It just means that it's, it can now respond to the clock. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
All right, anybody else? Yeah, Professor, um, in your recorded lecture on uh, Monday, you stated that it was going to be, you might open the test tonight at midnight. Is that still going to be the case, or do you plan on just opening it tomorrow morning? No, I'll, I'll, I'll probably open it tonight at midnight. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. All right, since it's 10 08, um, I probably need to take a look at the test before I uh, open it up, make sure everything's set to go. Um, all right, any last minute questions? No. When can we? Um, yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry, excuse me. Um, when can we expect uh, for you to upload the video for us to review it on our own time again? Uh, I'll, I'll upload this video uh, in you know as soon as it uh, takes it takes Zoom a few minutes to process it, and then I have to upload it to YouTube, and then uh, it takes YouTube a while to process it. But I'll put the link up, and you may not be able to see it for another twenty or thirty minutes, or a half an hour, or maybe even an hour. But Thank you. It, it'll be up eventually. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thank you.